Thanks, Shivnath. Uh, thanks to the Carnegie Foundation for having me here. Um, Shivnath called a few days ago and said that um, we're going to have a closed room discussion, which really excited me because uh, we've had our fair share of media interactions that I'm not very, very happy and proud of. Um, so I think um, my motivation for being here, what I promised Shivnath is I'll try and sort of give the view of what's happening in the, in the industry from an engineer and an entrepreneur standpoint. And to sort of uh, get things started, I thought I'll actually start by discussing the motivations for getting into this space and how I see fintech and what fintech really even means. Um, India right now is unique in just so many different ways. I think across sectors you're seeing one um, in terms of enablers, a government that's actually moving like a startup itself. Startups sort of meander and they try and figure out where they're going. Our government policy itself right now in the fintech space seems to be pivoting every about 30 days. Um, it's a fabulous, fabulous time because if you can stay abreast or perhaps read the future, um, there's a pot of gold in terms of being able to actually win the hearts of millions of consumers. The second is the confluence of global capital coming in. There's a glut, in fact. Um, in Bangalore, in fact, we often worry about the fact that there are too many VCs and too many private equity players and too many sovereign funds and strategic investors all lined up. If there is one large open market in the world right now, it's India. Whether it's New York, whether it's Shanghai, anywhere in the world, if you talk to a company that actually has free cash flow and they want to invest it, they're looking at India. And FinTech seems to be the hottest because that's the buzzword right now. The third is the fact that Technology infrastructure itself, with cloud computing and whatnot, compute power itself is improving exponentially and the costs are coming down exponentially, which makes for a fascinating sort of time um, where you can aspire to build solutions that will reach a billion people in a cost affordable manner. The fourth and very India specific is the sort of great work that NPCI has done because outside of the US, which had uh, Visa and MasterCard, we actually have a domestic network and is designed for the year 2017 and beyond. Um, I'm, I'm talking about UPI obviously, so I'm a pretty big UPI fanboy. Um, we started a journey about 18 months ago at a UPI inaugural event. It was a hackathon um, and Mr. Nilekani was there, Mr. Hota was there and they were talking about the banks in India agreeing to set up an interoperable network and they were asking technology companies and entrepreneurs to come and innovate. And they basically promised that you'd have an environment where really good consumer applications, last mile applications, enterprise applications could be developed on a robust backbone. Um, nothing more attractive than that because if you're a startup with limited resources but want to solve a problem, a problem needs to be broad based Payments, con digital payments is a very broad based problem. It appeals to us. The regulator and the banking system are robust, have been robust in India, thank God. Um, so when the bank said, we will continue to take on the responsibility of managing the money in the accounts, we want you to come and partner and build out really good last mile applications so that money can move between accounts, that was a dream come true. And I still remember there was about I think 500 invitations that they talked about and 3,500 people that actually showed up in Bangalore. Bangalore went crazy. I'm talking about Feb last year. Then in April they actually announced, um, I think the Honorable RBI Governor was there and he announced that in August we'll be going live. And a lot of us were still reasonably sort of cynical. We weren't sure that the big banks would actually come on board. And then Axis said that we are on board and ICICI said we are on board and some of the public sector banks said we are on board and it started looking really very, very real. Um, so I was about four months um, into my break post my, post my journey at Flipkart and my co-founder from my first venture, he quit his gig, my third co-founder in LA, he quit his gig. And he said, let's start. Let's try and figure out on the sandbox how real is the story gonna be. And today I'm really happy and, and proud to say that um, as an Indian, first of all, we should all just be really, really proud of the fact that UPI happened in India well before anything similar could happen in the US or Europe. So for that, I think we actually need to thank the banking system. They've done a phenomenal job. What the, what the sort of um, 
back behind the scenes who maneuvered whom and who got us to the state i don't really know as an entrepreneur i can just say that upi is real right now there's a lot to be done there's a lot of promises to be delivered in terms of capabilities that the platform can can enable um, there's a lot of operational issues that need to be resolved but in terms of a platform where all the major banks are here and here to stay i think we're there it's show times like show times here now um but in terms of major motivations for us getting in and i think a lot of the lot of the fintech companies here and startups that i see around the thing that's most exciting is that worldwide including in india i don't think there's going to be any innovation that will happen in the financial industry and not talking about fintech in the financial industry where the key enabler is not going to be technology itself there is nothing literally nothing that will come from the payment industry the payment banks industry the lending industry that will not be anchored around deep data and machine learning and right there i think we have when i look at these five words i think we are missing a sixth and it's policy and i think what we really need to be debating and we'll get into why is the fact that we are in a peculiar position we have multiple regulators nbfcs are regulated we have a ppi license at phone pay we are regulated we have multiple regulators actually making sure that we comply with the laid out policy but it is actually extremely unclear to me 18 months into this journey who defines the policy and that is um in fact we'll wait for mr hota as well that's it's one of the questions that we have and we asked this of neeti we asked this of the rbi definitely asked it of npci several times when you talk about policy in payments policy cannot be macro level only policy in terms of who can do what what can a non regulated entity do what can a regulated entity do who even should be regulated is still vague and i'll give you examples the co- the two companies that actually push the maximum ma- amount of money in the country through their pipes today build desk and tech process payment aggregators are neither ppi owners nor banks nor nbfcs between them last year 55 billion dollars of bill payment and practically a monopoly of all government utility payments happened through these two entities they're not part of any regulatory framework that that just it doesn't make any sense to me that in this day and age when we're talking about broad based payment acceptance that those entities don't have a role that they don't have a locus standi that needs to be resolved the only reason we actually at phone pay still have a ppi license i don't actually think wallets solve very much they actually make refunds easy i think wallets is fud economics you cannot have cost of money be the cost of a net banking or card transaction at 1.5% and then operate in a market where you're giving 10% cash back for acceptance it makes no sense i say this as a ppi member but my larger problem is if i'm not a ppi member i don't have a prayer of playing in upi because the only limited player definition of psps again another opaque phrase a psp today includes banks payment banks ppi players so you need a license for a product that everybody knows will not make money stand alone to be able to do other things and that's where as an engineer you you kind of struggle okay so do i apply for a payment bank license next will that allow me to play on upi on the issuing side i don't think payment banks will make money either because our dna unlike a telcos is not to get to 2 300 million people i think telcos have a phenomenal chance i actually think it's very progressive that the last telcos are all payment banks but what we know is we can build applications with very rich localization audio capabilities really good features and that's playing out for us um i was actually just um sort of ribbing mr kant outside um he mentioned that upi is doing 50000 transactions a day i know for a fact that's not true because we are doing 1 lakh transactions on upi every day and that is despite having had blockages by the largest retail bank despite the fact that every step forward that we take a new circular comes out 7 days later saying you cannot do this and then 4 weeks later we can proceed the reason i bring these things up is there are expectations from both parties 
the regulators and the banking system are looking to fintech companies for broadly three or four things innovation everyone talks about startups being innovative that's an easy one right they talk about broad penetration the policy makers the rbi everyone wants solutions that reach the last mile well those take resources and resources require capital capital requ requires investors to actually have some semblance of confidence in policy the third is consumer friendliness and this is something that all of us in the room expect as well my humble submission is if phone pay cannot out innovate bheem we should not even exist and if phone pay and bheem cannot out innovate the net banking applications there is no fintech industry so the burden is high you have to build very friendly consumer products the regulators ask which is also perfectly fair is that we grow up we mature and we offer consumer protection so no longer unlike other industries no longer in fintech is it okay to say i'm working in a garage i'm an entrepreneur i want to touch a billion dollars of tpv but i take no accountability for my actions and we are not of that ilk we take our responsibility very seriously there as well but what are our expectations of regulators or regulation the first is clarity in policy the clarity to me right now is lacking the clarity is lacking because again in the last 7 odd days we received one circular that came from cert saying all ppi owners must ensure that there is a second factor of authentication without answering the fundamental question if the primary use case for a wallet is an average 150 to 200 rupee transaction and the only reason people are using wallets in the first place is to get around clunky 2fa which has a sub 70% success rate who's going to be accountable for the loss in business so who do i go to next so search given one direction rbi came out with the master directive on ppis saying in 3 months you must cycle through your entire base and must do full kyc sounds good again sounds fair and sounds consistent here's a problem implementation so i'll speak for a competitor paytm claims to have 200 million customers take it with a pinch of salt 150 160 how do you cycle through 150 million indians and get them to do full kyc aadhar e kyc is not an option because the phone numbers map to your aadhar number per uid itself right now is 450 million people so that's 40% coverage you're disrupting somebody who's invested a billion dollars of capital to reach a couple of 100 million people started really pushing the envelope and making the fintech industry real and saying your business in 90 days will pretty much shrink by 70 to 80% and you have no specific policy maker that you can approach on this one i mean specific where does the buck stop who do i go to the second is is not just clarity on policy the second is in terms of inclusive policy inclusive policy means that if you are talking about payments i'll specifically talk about payments here uh, but the same applies to lending there is in almost every second regulatory note this phrase called psps payment service provider or payment service partner the definition however keeps changing depending on what products you are talking about so when we got our certification from npci we got it in writing with a stamp and a seal saying you've been certified on the psp acquiring leg three circulars in we were a upi compliant app six circulars in we were a upi based app circular number 15 came icici shut us down we said we will fight this circular number 16 we were nothing related to upi we suddenly overnight became a merchant app okay so what protections do i have now from the regulator i actually don't know so we are the largest UPI transaction enabling application in the country but i don't actually have any formal policy that actually clarifies my role nor a specific regulator for UPI where i can go and say what can i and can i not do which leads me to my next point i think policy is at a macro level but moving forward more and more we need to actually have neutral technology steering committees because at the heart of almost all the risk and fraud and concerns and insurance is technology solutions and unless you have people who are at the cutting edge of technology who can actually say these solutions are safe enough to roll out at 
sort of at a mass or broad based consumer level it remains weird having a discussion with somebody who looks at you and says but your role you're not a bank or your role is that you're not a payment bank my question to them is is my solution safe enough and they say yes then my next question to them is is this good for the market they say yes my third question is how do i become a bank and they say well that license is not available so it's kind of two steps forward three steps back on a good day three steps forward one step back but we need that clarity um i'll conclude by also saying that the third thing and i think a critical thing that the startup ecosystem and the technology industry will look for moving forward is consistent application of whatever regulation or policy comes in and by consistent application we mean that if the rules apply to a party the rules apply to everybody whether it's in a network whether it's in a payment solution or it's for kyc the size of the party cannot matter otherwise we can stop talking about fintech and we separate this out and say the large licensed financial bodies and small tech companies who used to be b2b service providers they should continue in that model today at the heart of the discussion we are having is the fact that consumer tech companies are saying i own the consumer i represent flipkart when i talk to banks they tell me you're going after my consumer i tell them i have 120 million legitimate consumers so who's taking who's consumer it's it's i think these discussions are mute i think the real discussions to have on the ground are what are the necessary certifications or or checks you need to have in place to offer indian consumer services what are sort of services that the that the government and policy makers believe we need to offer once the clarity sets in the market opens up thank you thanks amit for a quick primer uh, since we are live on facebook so pretty much i'm sure all the